my father died from ALS. And his first symptoms were simply that he had trouble tying his shoelaces and buttoning the buttons on his shirt. Three years later, he was dead. Um, my father was a wonderful human being. Uh, he was greatly loved, not only by his family, but by everybody who knew him. Uh, when he became disabled, and then shortly thereafter, he became dependent, then he became immobile, and then he became unable to speak, or communicate, it was a complete nightmare. My father's disease, ALS, brought me into contact with researchers dedicated to understanding and doing something about ALS. I joined this effort more than 20 years ago, and I've continued to be dedicated to try to help understand and do something about ALS research. The challenges are many, but I think the promise is enormous and the importance is absolutely overwhelming. And what I hope is that with more support, ALS research will be able to take advantage of what we've learned in the past years and really make a difference to do something about this horrific disease. So the development of this technique, which is called EIM, or electrical impedance myography, is, I, th I think, extremely important. What this technique basically does is measure an aspect of the electrical activity of muscles. But what it means is that now one can see changes in muscle electrical activity that occur in ALS over a short period of time in a non-invasive way at, at relatively low cost. And this is extremely important because what limits clinical trials in many cases is how long it takes, how many patients it requires, and fundamentally, how expensive it is. And a two-fold decrease in the cost of trials is an enormous difference in the possible uh, kinds of trials and the number of trials and the interest uh, that will be driven to do trials with new promising drugs. So I think the impact is, is likely to be quite substantial. Uh, the issues are basically that the funding for ALS uh, research has been relatively low and the clinical trials have been difficult to do in part because of the lack of a good marker for disease progression. Um, so it, what's really needed is more support to allow the biomedical research community to develop the best clinical hypotheses to be able to go into the clinic with prospective drugs and really test them. What we need to know is what causes ALS, how to intervene in this, in, in this process, and how to know if the interventions we attempt to use are actually doing anything. Well, government funding for ALS research has been relatively low compared to many other diseases, and certainly looking at what's going on in, in the country and, and the, inside the Beltway today, uh, we can't foresee great increases in support for the foreseeable future. And what this means is that doing ALS research and taking advantage of, of the knowledge and opportunities that are there uh, is going to become progressively more and more difficult. And I think individuals can do two things. One is individuals can support financially and in other ways those groups, those organizations that are interested in and promoting ALS research. They can donate to ALS research. And the second thing they can do um, is to engage in the process with Congress. And specifically, 
to advocate for the support of the National Institutes of Health. Because no matter what political or fiscal views one holds, not all government programs are identical in their value to society. And I think it's unquestionable that biomedical research and doing things that are going to improve the health of our country and, and the world um, should be at the highest priority. And I would argue not only should this be an area that isn't cut, this should be an area that is seeing increased support because of the opportunities for doing something about health and actually, in fact, for doing something about our economy uh, as well. This, I think, is something that everybody can do. Well, ALS is, is a horrific disease. A, a normally functional brain is trapped inside an increasingly dysfunctional body. We have to find a way to prevent or cure this disease. Our understanding of ALS genes, of ALS molecular pathways, of ALS cell biology, of ALS neurobiology, all of these have progressed strikingly. We are poised to take that next step and figure out how to develop a cure or even a way to prevent the onset of the disease. Last week, I met with one of the leading clinician researchers, clinician scientists involved in, in ALS studies, and he told me that he keeps a log of currently being, currently explored drugs for ALS, and on that log he has more than a hundred such drugs. We have to find out if these drugs actually will cure this disease. It's crucially important. I don't know if any of them will do this, but something's going to do it. And in order to find that something, we need the support to move forward. So programmed cell death, uh, often referred to uh, as apoptosis, involves an intrinsic program of cellular suicide. It turns out that cells in our bodies have the capability of killing themselves. And this can be true for any of the cells in our bodies. And in fact, is very important uh, when our nervous systems form, uh, very important as I sit here talking in, in my blood right at this moment. So there's a biology of cell death innate in all of us. And one hypothesis for some years now has been that some of the neurodegenerative diseases, diseases in which particular nerve cells die, could be diseases in which there is an unleashing at the wrong time or in the wrong cell type of this innate program of cellular suicide. Now, for many of the neurodegenerative diseases, such as ALS, it's not clear if this specific hypothesis applies. For some neurodegenerative diseases, for example, certain degenerations in the eye, it is absolutely clear that it's the case. But either way, as we learn more about what controls the life and death decisions of cells, um, I think we will learn more about that two dozen plus set of diseases we call neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS.